I think somewhere along the line I realized if I just stay being myself, a lot of good things will happen in a world where nobody stays themselves. And I'm a Jersey boy from the fucking streets of Edison, New Jersey, right? Like it is, this is how I talk. It feels, this is how it is in my head. No different than when you wrote that down to ask the question, like that's what was in your head. When I curse, it's in my head. And what's interesting is it used to mainly only come out more in like public speeches and things of that nature. And then, you know, like it's just, I just never think, brother, right? I'm never thinking, right? And what I mean by that is I'm just being natural at all times. And so I don't even know when I'm cursing, genuinely. Really, I really don't. It doesn't even register. There's never been a moment where like, I love when people like don't like it and they're like, he's forcing it. I just laugh so much. Cause I'm like, if these people knew how, I, like, there, if anything, there are times where I think about not trying to do it, but still can't control it because I'm just in my flow. As far as your first question, it actually ties to the second question. When I started public speaking and losing out on speaking gigs left and right because I cursed, I knew that I was gonna double down on what got me there, which was I'm not gonna overvalue other people's opinions, I'm gonna value my opinion about myself. The little voice in your head is called the insecurity devil. The insecurity devil on your shoulder is your worry is saying to you, don't do this because when you fail, the girl you like, your brother, your mom, your teacher, like someone's gonna think you suck and you believe them. And that's the problem. If people really got into a place of just doing things that they want to do and not worrying about what people thought about it, everybody would take risks in their 20s. You, by nature of being in this program, are already taking risks that are different than your contemporaries, so you're already halfway home. But this is still school, even though it's different. <clears throat> and the real world of jobs and companies and starting your stuff, that's the real jungle. This is just cool right now, what you're doing. But the real jungle is scary because there is no system. It's not subjective. You know, teacher Adam can't just say you're good. The world tells you the truth. And people are scared of the world. That's why we have professional students. And so, you know, I think um, the reason people are scared of the world is they actually think getting fired or having their startup fail or them not being able to be an influencer because nobody gave a fuck is a bad thing when I think it's a great thing. This all comes down to confidence and insecurity. The reason you won't do something is you are too insecure to do it. I am one of the all time worst students of all time. Like actually, like I was, you have to understand, I was in the height of college propaganda. When you go to school from 1982 to 1998, you were in the sweet spot of 16 years where I had teacher after teacher in middle school and high school tell me that I was going to be a garbage man because that was the bad thing. And so my failure was macro. Every grown up in my life, besides my parents, told me I was gonna fail. My teachers and all my friends' parents. I think I'm overly successful because it wasn't a failure. It was a failure of a generation of growing up. The entire world, the thing that everybody in this room is scared of, was shitting on me every minute on the hour. Because your entire self-worth was about your grades. They did not grow up with that. It was a big part of it, but they could have made up that they were an entrepreneur and people would have believed them. Right? I, you, they could have made up to their parents and teachers and said, I'm gonna make a million dollars on YouTube, and even though they didn't believe it, there was a 1% that they had to believe it because it's now true. When I was growing up, you were just fucking out. You know, convincing is a very dangerous game. What's, what happens is you get people on board through your actions. I'm such a great communicator, one would think that so much is going for me because of my communication. I would actually argue that my communication style 
is actually a detriment to me up front because there's a borderline level of cynicism that has to come along with the gift of gab that people use to protect themselves. And the reason I have anything meaningful is the truth of my actions eventually get those that are closest to see it on board and inspired to do. Lately, you know, as you pivoted five or six times yourself just in the last few years, where are you finding the most meaning in your pursuits? Oh, disproportionately in the Gary V of it all. Like, the Gary V content thing, like looking at these young faces and knowing that some of them think I'm cool, thus giving me leverage and equity for them to listen to me so that I can tell them that kindness and patience and humility and being a sweet person is actually the winning formula is massive. You know, when I get the feedback from people that you changed my life because I realized I didn't have to be a dick face and I'm not a dick face, Gary. I'm not a dick face, but I thought you had to be a dick face to win the game, right? Like to me that is profound. And you know, I think for the people here who like skew towards being a guidance counselor or like a camp counselor or like a head coach or you know, this will make sense to them because I have this in me. When you get your joy from other people getting joy from your actions, there's no better joy. It's just that what's I think a little bit unique about me if I'm like analyzing myself as if I'm not myself is that has come in like spiritual leaders, that's come in like parenting, that's come in guidance counselors and principals and it just, we haven't heard that from like gangster ass business people. You know, like I think that's what's probably, you know, as I analyze it, I'm like, why the fuck is this happening? I'm like, you know, that's right. Like I can't think of somebody who like fucking is crushing out here in that way that's also spewing grandma shit. It's extremely zen when you can balance ambition with patience and gratitude. For me, I'm just happy I'm playing and whether it works out or not is kind of irrelevant in some ways, truly. Of course I'd like to be successful in everything I do, but the not judging yourself against your own ambition is the superpower. And it's why you never burn out if you play that game. What's the number one thing you want everyone in this room to walk away with? And this question comes from Alana McMillan. (sighs) That I think there's literally 300 million different ways to win in the US, if that's how many people we have, right? Like that there is no blueprint, there is no exact way. It only comes down to being able to factor in the 40 or 50 indexes, input points, context points around your life and then navigating through that. And so what, what I really want is for people to understand, don't do it like me, don't do it like you, don't do it like Zucks, don't do it like Trap, don't do it like Cuban. Like, Spend as much time as you can, and Steph, I'll be honest with you, maybe you know the answer, I'm actually weirdly asking you. If I knew how to help people like create more self-awareness, it's what I would sell. I don't know if that comes through therapy or some system, or I don't know, I really don't. My fear is Please. actually the reverse in terms of with all of the information, with all the self-help, with all the people on Instagram saying these three easy steps, the fear is we are telling people as soon as you have a job that you, if you have a job that you like click and when you meet a man that you like click and then you can afford a house and then you have a baby, all of these things are the recipe for success. Well, if you're using some sort of Cosmo checklist for the recipe for success, you are going to end up very unhappy well, because success is internal. So I'll go a different way, fine, but I actually think we're in a much better place than we've been for the last 60 years on this issue. Why? Because prior to this world where we have so many more opinions and platforms, we had three channels that told everybody that thing. There was three old white guys that owned ABC and NBC and CBS. That's a great point. That completely pushed down to them what it was supposed to be. So now at least we have a lot more voices and there's more things to navigate. Thank you. One thing I look at when I look at your career, Gary. Well, listen, I get excited when you say that's a good point because I know how you roll and it is no, a good I, point. No, I think it's a it's really a good, good point. point. I there think it's three, a really good point. Three people are... said this is the American way, 
woman, you stay at home. Man, you do this. Everybody go work for the machine because that was an invested interest of all the people in the top. And so now at least they have more options. Now, Find your American dream. You know, now look, there's a lot of bad from that because there's a lot of fucking hucksters that are selling you guys bullshit that would have never gotten on TV that you now are listening to because you know, they're renting a $300,000 car for the day, taking an Instagram photo of it and saying, yo, you know, it's but so it's not, fucking okay, disgusting. But it's not, but hold on. Yeah. But it's not those hucksters fault. So everyone in the audience who complains that the Kardashians were on magazine covers 110 times last year, it's the, it's not 100%. the, hold on. But it's not the Kardashians it's fault. It's the market's nor is fault. It, it's not the media's fault. It's the the media will sell whatever you will buy. 100%. The problem is, if you don't like it, stop buying it. 100%. More importantly, stop judging other people's escapism. Like, I don't care if you like the car, good for you. I like the Jets. That could be a waste of five hours a day. It's grown, like, like I don't- Hold on a second. If we ask Lizzie, it's way more than five hours. It's probably right. Yeah. I mean, look, the fact of the matter is, is that everybody needs escapism. Everybody needs it. It's, a, it's, it's what music and entertainment and everything is built on. So I think we're wasting too much time judging people's choice of escapism. I'm saying don't listen to these hucksters because I think I'm gonna be played out to be right because I know what their intentions are. I know them. They're not doing the right thing. But I'll be very blunt with the 600 people in here. I don't care if you do it. I can't. I can't. I don't have enough time or energy in the day to individually care if you figured out that there is no quick fix in building something that puts you in the top 1% of something. who are rushing to say, Gary, solve my problem. I have Fund it every day. Business. I have it every day. I'm very comfortable in that environment. I give answers every day to that. And I'll decide what I want to do on an individual basis. And if I lose, then I deserve to lose. And if they lose, they deserve to lose. I am an absolute believer that the market is the market is the market is the market. And so you can trick the market for a few minutes and we could be upset about all the fake entrepreneurs or the funded companies, but there'll be a day that comes and then they'll all be gone and it'll be fucking awesome. And it'll be awesome, I'll tell you why. Because that's what's supposed to happen. Guys, nothing good comes easy. <laughs> like, what good stuff should come easy? Like, like I, and I use this word, audacity. If you have the audacity to be in the 1%, which one more time means you were making $400,000 a year before taxes, which is, by the way, a booby prize to most people when they think about entrepreneurship. I don't know anybody in entrepreneur tech land or entrepreneur, solo entrepreneur that thinks that 400,000 a year is the North Star. It's much bigger than that. I get the emails every day. Everybody thinks a million a year is like the minimum cost of entry to anything, right? Okay, so, but Gary, yes. someone always has to pay. This whole idea that, you know, I'm gonna build a multi-million dollar uh, business. I want everyone to get free pre-K. There is no light at the, there is no gold at the end of the rainbow. Someone has to pay. Okay. So this idea that, oh, well no one, no one thinks $400,000 is a lot of money. When are we gonna click and realize, oh shit, it is. You Never. can't go- Our whole entire human race from the beginning of mankind has proven we will never do that. It's just not a human way. Like, and that's fine, there's nothing wrong with, like, great. Like, we, you know what, by the way, I'm the biggest fan of humans, we're still here. Like, I actually think, I actually think humans are the most underrated brand in the world, I actually believe that. What does that mean? I'll explain. <laughs> I'll explain. I think humans I'll are tell the most you, underrated brand in the world. The world that you live in, yeah. big media, has done a really good job in convincing every mother in here that they shouldn't let their kids play outside. Because they fucking, reported on kidnapping until they couldn't get enough of it, right? And so now we have a generation of people that don't want to put their kids outside, yet we're safer than ever because of devices. Nobody's kidnapping anybody, yet the propaganda filled us nice and good, right? And so, what does it mean? I mean, humans could do anything to each other. We should have blew each other up a long time ago with the atomic bomb. We could do, I, I could stab you in the face with this fork right now, right? Like that now can happen. Now we're streaming on MSNBC. And so, but think about this. Think about, think about how much damage we're capable of to each other. We do so little. The problem is mainstream media reports on that .01%. I really believe that. I really think, I really am, a big believer in that. I'm stunned how good people are. I love it. How would you define emotional intelligence? 
I think it's the things that are actually happening in our world. I think it's the things that are happening that we can't explain this, of course we can. Like charisma matters, right? Like, like intuition matters. Like deploying empathy and gratitude matter. These are real things, that's why they exist. That's why they're words, they're real things. And so I would define them as the, all the things that aren't about black and white, either data or math or written words or information that really separate people from success or not. I consider it likeability is a good word. I think likeability is a very, you know, likeability is completely predicated on emotional intelligence, right? And so I think it's, I actually think because information is becoming commoditized by the internet, it's never been, I actually think I'm a complete byproduct of the internet becoming important because I think I so over skew in emotional intelligence and under skew in you know, IQ that um, I think I'm a preview of things to come. Do you think we've become too reliant then on big data? Big, you know, the fact that we talk so much about it, it sort of takes out the element of surprise. You know, I, I take you to the NBA, Mark Cuban would say, implementing big data is the key to having a winning team. And at the NBA Tech Conference, Charles Barkley and Magic Johnson sat there and Charles Barkley said, big data, big data, you know when a boy has basketball skills. Forget big data. So what's both. the right lane? Both. It's just both, right? Like, I love big data, but do you know where my success and VaynerMedia's for their client success comes from with big data? Having the human ability to interpret it and turn it into something. And talent trumps all. What Barclay's argument is, and Barclay's very right in a lot of areas and a little bit wrong in some other areas, in my opinion, I know his argument on this, which is, look, talent's gonna trump anything. If, like, basketball especially, like, look who's won the NBA title for the last 30 years. It's been, like, the 11 guys, right? Like, like in basketball, one player, unlike any other sport, fundamentally dictates the outcome because they play, they play both ways, not like football and baseball, right? They, it's just clear, right? Um, that being said, you can maximize your You talent. can maximize, that's it. And you can maximize getting a role player who hits corner threes because that's the highest percentage. And so the Spurs have used that, the Rockets have used that like to win more games. So it's both. I actually think once we wrap our head about privacy, we're about to go through a real unbelievable era. I think I'm gonna miss what it. What do you mean? I think once we go through a full cycle, I think 80 years from today, humans are gonna live a much happier life, life than we do now because there'll be less privacy. I think once we all wrap our heads around, I think I live, a, um, stick with me, I think I live a happier life and I'm a better man because I know a lot of people are watching me and it's changed my behavior. And so I'm optimistic. Wow, that, what were you doing before? Nothing, <laughs> but. I mean, you just open, okay. it, how does it I'll, change I'll, your behavior? Fine, uh, Alex, uh, Liz's brother-in-law, uh, Liz's brother, my brother-in-law, had a wedding, we went to Vegas, and I decided not to go to the Spearmint Rhino because I was exploding on Twitter at the time and I thought it would be a bad idea if For somebody took a who picture. For those don't know what Spearmint Rhino is, it's the most well-known gentleman's club just off the Las Vegas Strip. Right, so, like, just little things like that. Like, I looked that up. Like, like you know, like, I, you know, I, I just truly believe that when you're living your so life So had on, you not been blowing up on social media, you would have been front and center and throwing not, dollar bills. And that's right, yes. And, 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 and more importantly, not that that's bad, but I'm watching a lot of people's behavior shift. And look, who decides what's good and bad? And you can get into very big arguments, but I'm telling you right now, when you wrap your head around knowing that everything you write and everything you do is searchable, your whole world changes. If I told all my homies right now, hey bro, every single thing you send to a girl on Tinder eventually be searchable under your name, I think some of the shit they'd write would be different. How did you get to this point with your mindset regarding culture? Like, where does that come from? Is that something that you were raised with? Is there a moment that made you realize that? Um, it's, it was something I was born with. And I know that because it was funny, I had my, I had my friends that I grew up with when I was from first grade to seventh grade in Edison, New Jersey on, the, on a podcast the other day. And it, we didn't get to some of these things on the podcast, but it got my brain remembering. They were talking about, this is really funny actually, they were talking about the fact that I used to get into fights a lot. 
So I was like a real like scrapper, New Jersey kid. Like, like I'm talking like fix, like yeah. fights. Yeah. And, and it reminded me that a lot of my fights came from me defending when people picked on people. So I was on like some superhero shit from the get kind of thing, meaning I've always been uncomfortable with people being mean to people. It's what really fucks me up with society right now because both sides of the political party are fully into that place now. And so I, the answer to your question is, this is some real shit. I am so uncomfortable when there is tension, I can't even live within it. It's, it's a visceral reaction to me, you know? Even if like, you know this Dustin, even when me and Dustin are traveling, right? If I don't like the way his face looks, I'm like, are you good? Like it's my natural state, everything cool? Like I don't like it. And because I have so much inten- intuitive, like spiritual energy that comes natural to me, I'm always, I always know. I mean, there's some shit, like some of the stories of employees, you know how some of the eight and nine and 10 year employees come and tell you shit like he knows or this, it's cause it's, it's some spooky shit, Isaiah. It's like, I'll be going to the bathroom and I'm like, I don't like the way that felt. And then I'm like, admins, can you give me 15 with that per-? Like, so there was no choice. Then, so cool, I gave you that frame up. Now it gets even weirder. Then I go into working for my dad at 14. So this is my natural state. This is my essence. And then I go into work in my dad's liquor store and it's a toxic disaster. Mm. My dad, who I struggled with for the first seven or eight years on this, and maybe even 10 years on this, and maybe even 20 years on this, until I realized that my dad grew up in the Soviet Union where every employee stole everything and it was so toxic that it formed him. My dad's point of view was that employees were your enemy. My dad's greatest fear 24 7, 365 in my teenage years was the employees are stealing. Right. And, like, and I, I just want to say um, that, like, congratulating you on the fact that you've established a culture here that genuinely feels like a family only two months in with my team and idea generation and teamwork and everything that goes into the ad business. Um, it's never felt so like pure and genuine and it comes so easy. So I think you've done a great job at, you know, responding to that. I appreciate that. And I'll say this for the people on here. And if you don't have it, if that's a 10 and you're sitting right now and you're not, you're not in the chat and you're thinking that's not what I have. then that's, that's something I realize is real. We have 1800 employees and I'm a human being. I understand how shit works. I'll give you an example. There was something that happened years ago that really stuck with me. Somebody who was an 11 on culture, an 11, out of nowhere, like little smoke started popping up. XYZ made me upset today. XYZ da da da. And when I got to the bottom of it, her father was dying from brain cancer. And she brought that to work. And like, of course, when you're scared, you know this, all of you know this about yourself. When you're most scared, it's only one of two things that are gonna happen. And so I don't sit here in an ivory tower delusional that everybody's hitting at an 11 of a 10. But I do sit here in my ivory tower knowing that I spend an ungodly amount of energy, time and effort, you know, and tons of money compared to companies that look like this on trying to get every situation to 11 of 10. And that's why we win. Cause there's never an interest for us to look the other way because we don't value the money, we value the culture. We need the money to pay the bills. Honey empire, right? I gotta be practical. This is not delusional school, but I'm feeling really confident. And I will tell you every month that goes by, we've got it better and better and better. And that's really, especially last three years. And that's really exciting to me. Just to build on that, Gary, I think that was a a nice reminder for me in the all hands the other day when I think one of the questions was, how are we gonna win? And I thought you were gonna go right to sock. You're like, people first. Like, oh shit, that's right. That's what we start with. <laughs> so it's a good reminder for me too, personally as well. Yeah, the, to your point, the reason it's people is if you have continuity, you win. 
I talk in like sign language and like ESP with like Marcus and Hannah and you and like, and Kaylin and like, we go fast. Speed matters. You know, like when you, tr when you trust your fellow employee, you're actually working on the work instead of the politics. So many of you have friends right now that you guys over a beer or when you hang out, like they're just talking, all the energy's on the toxic fucking politics. Right? All of it. So yeah, I mean, I, I know why we're gonna win and it's because of how I think about this. What is probably like the most memorable or like the most important life experience you've had like in the last like recent years that have made you like really develop and grow as a person with just like business wise, personally wise in relation to anything. Candor has forever been a weakness of mine and has always been the um, weakness of this organization. You know, I just don't like confrontation. You know, the you know your gift is your is your curse. The reason we have this great culture is because I hate negativity and confrontation. The reason it took us a little while to get it really good is I love it so much that I mistreated it, and where candor really mattered, I was unable to deliver it. Thus, that trickled down to the organization. And so the biggest vulnerability this company had for years was the most senior people over time realized that they didn't actually know where they sat with me. And so what that did was, it was a very devastating day. My, no question, the most difficult day of my career happened about four years ago when I realized, so my number one thing is that my job is to eliminate fear as a leader. When I had to realize, looking myself in the mirror, that me not being candorous led to a lot of people not knowing where they stood, which actually created fear, was heartbreaking. And, you know, I feel like now we're much better for it. And so I, I would say that is the answer. I wanted to know, like, what's your perspective on why you think there's a divide between people who are pro metaverse and why like big tech companies like snap and apple and stuff are still like naysayers or who don't believe fully who don't give into the concept of the metaverse and what's really causing this divide according to you and financial and interest okay <laughs> microsoft wasn't into the internet financial interest and and timing, uh, you know, the metaverse, if we're talking metaverse, it, you know, because you know this, the metaverse can mean a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So if you're using the metaverse as slang for Web3, that's one thing, aka blockchains that have consumer applications like NFTs. If you're using the metaverse like VR, I believe that VR will happen one day, but I also think Facebook could overinvest in it because it might be too early. You know, like, I don't like investing in things all the way um, until it's a little more obvious that it's real. Nobody here knows anybody who spends two hours a day on VR. So I think that, you know, but I think to answer your question, it's all financial interest. And by the way, this is one day you'll realize what's cool about being 45 or 46 or 47, like I'm gonna be in four days, is it's pattern recognition. Let me give you an example. You know how people say like, why does that need to be an NFT? Can't you do it this way? Let me give you one that's gonna blow all your minds. When I launched winelibrary.com in 1997, which in itself is wild because there are many people here who were born after 1997. So when I launched winelibrary.com in 1997, do you know what people said to me? They said, Gary, why do you need a website? You could just do a catalog. Think about that. Like, for real, like real business people, real grownups. Like, why would you build a website? You could just do a catalog. You know, why do I think tickets are gonna be NFTs? Because they're better than QR codes. 
And why did all our tickets be our, become QR codes? What was wrong with paper? So this is just pattern recognition for me. The number one thing everyone here has to leave Vegas for and go back if they want to really substantially grow their business is becoming great at operating in underpriced attention. Underpriced attention in 1998 was email. How many people here have done email marketing in their careers close enough to it that they could have a sense? Raise it high, I just want to get a sense. Good. So this will make a lot of sense for a lot of people. In 1999, I had an email newsletter that had 200,000 people on it that had 90% open rates. So for the people that don't follow email, you're crushing it today with 30% open rates. Meaning, you send an email, 30% of them actually open it, and then there's a whole other thing, do people even act on it? In 1998, I had 90% of the people opening the email, because in 1998, we hadn't ruined email yet. Right, you didn't get all the spam you've gotten in the last 25 years. We were opening it. And I realized very quickly, direct mail was working for me, but email was free. I remember I was sending so many emails in 19, Here's, a, here's one prediction I got super wrong. From 1998 to 2000, I sent so many damn emails because I was convinced that at some point they were gonna charge for this shit. Right? Like it just didn't make sense, it was too effective. I was saving tens of thousands of dollars on direct mail and radio and doing email for free and it was crushing. That's the underpriced attention of 1998. Having a website, doing email, and then finally, the day Google AdWords came out, I bought up every wine term you can imagine. For six months there, it wasn't even 10 cents a click for, it was five cents a click, and I crushed. And so in a very short period of time, with absolutely no money, with no money, I was able to grow a very large business, and it became the foundation of how I think. And I sit here today, for example, how many people here produce organic, no paid advertising, organic, creative, and post for their business on TikTok. Raise your hand. I want to leave right now. <laughs> One more time, raise your hand if you're posting for TikTok. So this is like a travesty. Every single person here, whether you think China's manipulating the kids or not, Every single person here has to immediately understand what's happening here on TikTok because it's not even about TikTok. It's about the TikTokification of social media. The, for as few hands as went up right now, you can't imagine like how the juices are flowing through my body because in a good way. Because for me, 30% of what I like about public speaking is I know this format is the format that gets somebody to do something that they haven't been doing, and then four years from now, I get the email. I mean, I live on positive affirmation, so I get the email of like, hey, I was at the conference, it's what, like, this is a big deal. Every, this is real now, whether you have one unit, or three units, or 30 units in this system. My personal belief, by the way, I don't own your business, I don't know you. So whether you do this or not is kind of irrelevant to me, other than, I know it will be historically correct, and I hope a lot of you do it. And for the people that raised their hands earlier, one more time, people that consume my content. So all the hands that are up right now, all of you know I've been saying this for four years. This is not this week. For four years I've been talking about this. What's the difference today than four years ago is Instagram and YouTube and Twitter and Snapchat are all now doing the same thing. Social for 15 years was build as many followers as you can and then post, it was almost like email marketing. Build a list, post, a certain percentage see it. That whole game is now out the window. Now the creative is the variable. There are people in here who've never posted on TikTok, are about to get motivated by the next 30 minutes, will post their first TikTok tomorrow and some of you will get 12 views on that and others will get 13,000 even though all of you have zero followers. This is, you know, this is a very profound thing. Like I understand I'm like speaking it a little bit quick, especially if you don't have the context. But the fact that you can post videos and potentially millions of people can see them, it's a very big deal. And if you have not, at least done 10 hours, that's all I'm asking for, which is time, but you can do this at midnight, you can do this when you travel back, 10 hours of homework on best, and all you have to do, like, let me give you a website that 
all of you should be referencing to get all the information for modern marketing by the hour. Uh, I'll, I'll spell it out because I know a lot of you are taking notes. G-O-O-G-L-E.com. You can literally type in how does a fitness store do TikTok, enter. How do I make TikToks for my gym, enter. Anything you can think of. The amount of information for free is staggering. Of course some of it isn't great, which is why I want you to spend 10 hours so you can cross reference and not just the first article. I genuinely believe, standing on this stage, that if everybody in here spends five to 10 hours getting deeply educated on best practices on how to make organic TikToks, or you can make them Instagram Reels, Facebook Reels have exploded, and that demo is extremely interesting for this audience and their locations, but it's all the same practice. How do you make videos that actually bring people value? This is not an infomercial, this is not a commercial. This is a video that brings value to them, thus brings awareness to you, thus brings business to you. This is a real commitment. The reality is whomever here outflanks the rest of the world in producing social content is going to win. What is holding so many people back here is ideology. There's a lot of people in this room that are not doing this because they made a theoretical decision on what it is or what it can do. But let there be no confusion. The data is very clear. The attention of our society is on these platforms. Maybe you wish it was still in magazines. Maybe you love radio for some weird ass reason. (laughs) Probably you have an issue with it because social media is being blamed for humans' activities. Because to remind everybody, social human, social media are empty pipes. They have nothing. It just takes what humans put into it. Social media hasn't changed us. Social media has exposed us. And so maybe you don't like that. I respect that. You can do whatever you want as a human being. As a business owner, you don't get to decide where the customer's attention is. You get to decide if you would like to execute where the customer's attention is and grow your business. If you are so theoretical about social that you would not like to do that for your business, I commend that. I find that admirable. It's also a very bad business strategy. That's up to you. I'm unemotional about it. But that is what is happening. And so the reality is is we have this mass underpriced attention and let me tell you why it becomes a humongous deal for everybody here. I don't know if you know the term CTV or OTT, connected television or over the top, but I definitely know you know what Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, HBO Max, and all the rest are. These platforms are taking all the attention out of television. The amount of people here who watch NBC on Wednesday night at 9 p.m. is zero. (laughs) Zero. Commercials have $80 billion in ad spend a year. Mainly with the Fortune 500 companies, BMW, Nike, all this. Those companies are now, especially with a looming recession coming, finally starting to understand that when they run a commercial on a sitcom or a reality show on cable, that they are taking good cash and lighting it on fire and throwing it in the garbage. This is what I do for a living in VaynerX, if you saw earlier. I run an advertising agency that has 2,000 employees globally. I have been the Pied Piper for social for 13 years, and I can tell you, because I'm in the trenches, the biggest companies in the world are about to reallocate their money much more into social than television. Why am I bringing that up? I believe for the entrepreneurs in this room, there's a 24 to 36 month window when the getting is good. It's not as good as it was four years ago, but I believe in three to four or five years, it's gonna be really not good. Because the 80 billion, if 40 billion or 20 billion comes into TikTok and Facebook and Instagram and whatever it is, Be Real, Vine, it's always gonna evolve. Not if, when that money comes in, everything I'm passionately communicating to you right now will not be as easy. There's a substantial opportunity in 2023 to take this underpriced attention opportunity and really grow it. I legitimately worked from 20 to 30 
seven days a week, 15 hours a day, every single day. Like, I took no time, zero. So, do I wish that I took maybe a week, you know, a year? I do. Um, but it also comes back to your point, which is my biggest thing is, you know, you know, especially I always love when I'm in Europe because Europe always has this funny, you know, overlay. You know, I was born in Eastern Europe. I've, I grew up in the wine business, so I spent so much time in Europe. And Europe has a far more progressive point of view on work-life balance and things of that nature. For me, I don't care if you work 100 hours a week for the rest of your life or four hours a week. I think back to the energy that he was deploying, and I think I can relate to it. You have to be respectful of your ambition. I think the biggest issue I have right now is people need to be more self-aware of what makes them happy. Yeah, exactly. You know, so for me, being a workaholic is far more happiness than not. Like to me, the process is my drug, not the stuff, not anything else. So I, you know, look, you're so young. You, you'll be able to accomplish all of it. You know, I, I. When people ask me what would I tell myself, sure, like, you know, I, I think about spending a little bit more time with my wife before kids, with, with my friends post college, but I don't, tr- I, don't, I don't regret it at all because it was what allowed me to have that foundation and I feel at 42 or 38, I feel like a kid, I feel like I can do a lot of things. They're different, there's different things when you're single with a family, there's a million different things. My biggest thing is you're not gonna know the alternative. The biggest thing about people looking backwards that I always try to tell, or when kids come to me or older people, they're trying to make a decision, I always try to remind them, no matter what decision all of you are gonna make, you're not gonna know what would have happened if you did the other thing. So I, you know, I think like, you know, people try to control things that are not controllable. You know, I'm sure both will work out. You know, could you go, you know, for example, let's say you leave here, inspired by other people's questions or things of that nature and you decide you're gonna take two weeks extra vacation that you would have never taken every year. In 11 years you'll be like, I'm so glad I did that. Why? Because you'll have these incredible experiences in Ibiza and Egypt and in New York, right? What you don't know is maybe if you did work those two weeks, one of those videos would have changed everything and all the other business and competitive things that you wanted to achieve would have been achieved, yet, you didn't get it because you went on the fucking beach in Ibiza. <laughs> that is my problem. <laughs> and more importantly, you just won't know. You're gonna know what you do. You don't know what would have happened. Thoughts? Yeah, and you don't, I don't think you need to be thinking like, what if? Like, the only thing that really matter is like, just be really thankful for yourself when you're doing whatever you're doing. That's the main thing, I think. Like, it's like, and just like say, thank you, thank you, Ronnie. Like, you did this. And try to enjoy it, try to be present when you, when you do your videos. I think, I think when you listen to this, that's to me the ideological, altruistic, good feeling that, by the way, I live that. I, I live exactly like that. I also answered with the actual practical thing. I think a lot of times when people get crippled by these questions that I think we all struggle with, they don't go to the practical part. Brother, you're not gonna know. So when you're not gonna know, and you can be thankful for what you do know, it gets real simple. And I just think people are spending too much time dwelling or looking backwards or debating on things that ultimately don't play out. So, you know, I would go with whatever feels best at that moment. You know, you feel like you wanna take a vacation, take it. You don't, don't. I think way too many people are playing by the rules of the current state of what's politically correct instead of really listening to themselves. People give me unlimited parenting advice on DM and email. They don't know anything, I'm like you. I don't share anything about my family. They have no context, none. But they have an ideology of how they see it. They think I'm working too hard. I respect that, I understand. I also know that so many of my friends who work nine to five, when they go home, they watch TV and work on their phone. So, you know, quality, quantity, relationships, what my wife and I grew up with affected how we see it. You know, our kids, the age of our kids, my eight and five, like there's a million different things. So I wouldn't beat yourself up. This has a lot to do with decisions that my wife and I have made about the way I story tell my life versus the way I story tell my private life. Uh, You know, I, I look at things in net game form, right? For example, what? 
Let's just, let's just, as a matter of fact, this is actually very convenient. Didn't even think about this, because I didn't really know the questions today. Um, let's just, let's just, let's just zoom it in, DRock. Let's just zoom in where I was this morning, because I worked out at six, right? Uh, you tell me when, and you may not be able to pull it off. Do you think you'll be able to pull it off? Uh, can you hold it closer? I can. Yeah, a little bit more. Yep. Yep, and there we are. Good. So look, look at this. Ha ha ha. I went to the kindergarten play today, right? I went to the kindergarten play. As a matter of fact, I was there half an hour early to be first in line at the kindergarten play this morning. And, you know, look, oh look, look at this stuff that I never share. And this one you're gonna have to blur out, D-Rock, because this is the point of the answer, but here we go. Let's just see the last couple of videos that were taken. Oh look, look at these, look at these videos. Look at these videos of, you know, kids singing. <laughs> you know, kids singing. Yeah, kids. My friends, here's what this one comes down to and I have enormous amounts of empathy and self-awareness to why this question is asked all the time and when I talk about 19 hour days and when D-Rock and I and Stevan put out a day in the life video and it shows all this and nobody wants to envy it. I'm playing in extremes. First and foremost, when there are important events like this, you know, the kind of things that my dad never came to because he set the foundation to it, I'm there. I'm at the play, I'm at the recital, I'm at this, I'm there. On weekends, I'm all in. All in, my friends. All in on weekends, right? I'm not playing four hours of golf like a lot of you. Uh, I'm not doing a lot of other things that a lot of people are doing. I'm all in on the kids, right? Um, Then I'm taking, oh, I don't know, seven? Seven weeks of vacation? Which is probably in the ballpark of four or five weeks more than you. Right, more than you, which is high quality time all in every second. And so, yes, maybe I'm playing Monday through Friday, you know, 40 weeks a year at an intensity that's different, but I have found my cadence, my, my rhythm, my, 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 my balance with my spouse and my children predicated on playing it that way. Um, and I'm finding a lot of quality time with them in these extremes. And so, you know, I think. I, I never judge or ask or tell anybody how to raise their family or do their thing. The other thing I've decided is, unlike a lot of my contemporaries and a lot of social media experts who I don't think exploit their kids on social networks, but I would say are intriguing about being so obsessed with ha- getting likes and hearts that they know when they use their cute kids they get more. It's kind of, I've been in many conversations sitting right here at conferences. I'm right here, but I'm listening always, you know, because that's how I roll, and I'm doing my thing. And I've heard many people talk about strategies around how, oh, put your kids in stuff, you'll get more likes. I'm like, really? So, you know, I've chosen, my wife has chosen, uh, we have chosen to, you know, as you guys know, there are very few pictures or any kind of public pictures of my wife or my kids. It's just what's comfortable to us. So I'm very self-aware about the uh, rationale to why people may question my ability to be a good dad or do my thing. The other part of this answer is, Mission Xander three and six. This is the system, and they were two and five, five seconds ago, and da 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 You know, as things evolve, as they're in softball and soccer and football and this and that, you know, um, they're, you know, I'll adjust and my schedules will change. And, you know, big thing in 2016, I've been giving a lot of thought to is coming home uh, every day at 5 p.m. for 30, 40 minutes to eat or bathe. And so I'll adjust and I'll try and I'll hustle and I'll work and I'll continue to always struggle with work life balance given my happiness and my ambition, my selfishness around work. However, uh, there are a lot more things going on here than just the things you're making assumptions on, rightfully so, given the content that I'm putting out. Um, but that's why even that video we talked about and ended with, and big ups to Alex on our team to push this, which really made that video whole, which was, that's me, do you. And so um, I feel super cozy uh, about the time allocation. I would also argue, my friend, about uh, quality. Because plenty of people who work nine to five, come home, uh, drink a beer, watch TV, play video games, and spend, oh, I don't know, six seconds yelling at their kids to do homework. And so there's quantity. Uh, which you know, I like to think I'm maybe playing a good game on on extremities, and then there's also quality, like you know, actually having a relationship, like actually having a conversation, actually spending quality time, actually looking them in the eye, actually, actually, actually. So, work-life balance, 
course. That I'm you the shouldn't one who's, work, I'm work the one hard. That gets picked on for that because the manifestation of me believing in hard work has been, you know, I say that I sleep six, seven, and eight hours and that nobody should do anything that doesn't make them happy and that making $47,000 a year and being happy is amazing and yet people want to make me the poster child of overworking and burning yourself out. I get it. I understand what happens once you hit a certain tier. I also understand that maybe I could have done a better job earlier in the process of my career in creating clarification. Thus, I'm okay with getting link baited into some of these conversations. But um, listen, I believe in work-life balance. I just think my work-life balance is different than yours. I also think that happiness needs to be thought about. And like, when you love what you do, like, this is my hobby. You also have to know what you want, right? If, Correct. If, if, if you and want to be a billionaire, you're not going to do it yeah, by and, just sleeping all day. Yeah, and by the way, let me say it one more time because I've got to clarify it all the fucking time. <laughs> I'll say it for the 9,000th fucking time. The pursuit of trying to buy the New York Jets is my passion because it allows me to play the game that I love. I love being a businessman the way a lot of you love playing football, the way a lot of you love to ski, the way a lot of you love to read the way a lot of you love to cook, watch Netflix, hang out with your friends. If given the option, besides garage sailing and watching the Jets professionally, forget about family, that's on a pedestal that nothing can touch. Outside of spending time with my inner family and closest friends, and outside of garage sailing and watching the Jets, there's nothing I'd rather do than work a 15 hour day. You're self aware, you know you. And I always have. This is why I shoveled snow and did lemonade and I washed fucking cars as a seven year old all day long on August 9th because it's what I like. And I'm not gonna judge somebody who wants to work nine to five, be on 13 fucking softball teams and play fucking video games all day and make 42K a year. If she and he are pumped as fuck, they're equal to me because I know a bunch of miserable fucking billionaires and I know a lot of fucking happy 55K a years and everything in between. So here's my thing. If you listen carefully, I'm only spitting two core things. You be self-aware and you make yourself happy and don't let anything other variables, you adjust to macro variables. And two, this is what makes me happy. A lot of people are spitting their ideology on other people, especially after they've already accomplished something.